Now, where did I put it? Hmm. Ah, here it is. Welcome to the Toolbox, where my guests and I discuss the tools they use every day to manage life, trauma, and everything. It may not be applicable right now, but it's another tool for your toolbox. And I hope you enjoy. Hey everybody, welcome back to Tools with Toolbox. I am Chance Burles, also known as a Big Bird. Uh, another little moniker I picked up while jumping out of planes. And um, <laughs> my, uh, I have another outstanding guest for you all today. Um, coming from all the way down in Texas. Uh, we'll get this started the same way I do it with everybody else. Who are you? And give me a little bit about your background. So I, my name is Yehuda Reamer, and I have a brand called the Pew Pew Jew. I'm an Orthodox Jew, exactly. I'm an Orthodox Jew who grew up in Los Angeles, lived there for 30 years, got smart enough to move the hell out about eight years ago, uh, living in uh, the golden state of Texas that I absolutely mm -hmm. love. I write children's books on firearm safety, firearms education, history of the two-way Hell, I even have 105 explosive gun jokes. Um, yeah, like a literal joke book. So, yeah, I mean, that, I, I've been in the industry for about five years with all my work. Um, I do firearms instructing here in Texas. And I call out Jews who are anti-gun. So that's it's kind of like the real, real shortened version. Short version. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about like the super bridge version. So, well, what, what brought you to this realm like i mean if you're talking about the two-way realm uh down in the states and canada we don't really have it but right firearms uh are a interesting topic up here in canada but what led you down the road to get into this field yeah absolutely so the first um the first time i bought a gun uh it was a glock 19 gen 3 it was my first gun and i kind of kept the uh, the idea i well i kept it from my parents even though i was married i had two kids i was living in the apartment but I didn't tell my parents that I owned a firearm. And one night we were by my parents' house and my younger brother was like, hey, man, when would you go shoot your gun? And, you know, and my parents, you know, full on Chernobyl meltdown, right? Like total, yep. total nuclear meltdown. And they didn't talk to me for weeks. And when they finally did, it was, you know, how, how can you how can you bring firearms into the home? It's you're irresponsible. You're someone's going to get killed. You know, the, the whole every, stuff we've all heard numerous times before. Mm -hmm. And it got me thinking that as much as my parents are crazy, that they're wrong, you know, as a firearms owner and with two kids in the house, um, I need to take firearm safety incredibly seriously and mm -hmm. I need to educate my children so they know what to do. So I went to, um, I went to the NRA's website, I found the Eddie Eagle program. And I found myself going through their materials and re realizing like, hey, whoa, there was so much more to gun safety than what to do if you find a gun somewhere it's not supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So one night um, I went to my synagogue for prayers and the rabbi was speaking and really didn't like this rabbi, so didn't care what he had to say. And uh, here I was, I pulled out my phone on my uh, Apple Notes and I wrote my first book called Safety On, which is an introduction to the world of firearms for children. Mm -hmm. And I kind of wrote, I kind of wrote it for fun. I never thought, oh, oh, let me let me take a step back. After the NRA, after I looked at the NRA's website, I went to Amazon to go buy a book for my kids, and I was shocked that there were no books on the market, zero, mm. on wow. gun safety for kids. Um, again, there's books out there for parents on how to talk about gun safety, but there was nothing for children specifically. Mm. So like I said, you know, I, I wrote the first, my, my first book on my phone. I emailed it to a buddy of mine who was in the Los Angeles police department. Uh, he called me up and he said, um, your book sucks because you got the information wrong, but I'm going to walk you through this because this is a book that needs to get done. Awesome. And yeah, and uh, it took me about five and a half, six years to get my first book published. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no one, no literary agent or publishing company really wanted to touch a book that's pro kids, pro guns, 
Yeah. Um, especially no one, especially with someone who doesn't have a following, didn't have a, didn't really have a social media presence because I was never really big into social media beforehand. So, uh, you know, no one was like, y- you're a scrub. No one's nothing, you know, it's never going to happen. Um, I had a lot of detractors telling me, don't do it. Uh, the book is not going to succeed or, you know, don't get into the firearms industry. It's a bunch of good old redneck KKK members and they're going to be anti-Semitic. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you know what? Screw screw you all. Um, I'm going to get this book published one way or another. And you know what? If I deal with anti-Semitism, then I'll deal with it. Let, let's, let's see how it goes. And finally, in about 2017, January of 2017, uh, I found a small publisher. A few weeks later, the book was out. I had published my first book. And I got some really big names right off the bat to endorse the book. Um, Alan West, Alan Gottlieb from the Second Amendment Foundation, Masada mm-hmm. Yub, um, Rob Pincus, uh, and some other really big instructors who were all saying, well, this book is amazing. We've never seen anything like it. And one thing led to another. And I never thought that, you know, I didn't think it was going to be successful even after I got it published. But the next thing I know, uh, you know, Alan Gottlieb is like, hey, you know, we put on the gun rights policy conference every year. Uh, do you want to speak? And like at that time, I mean, this was like four months after my book came out. At that time, I still knew like nobody in the firearms industry. And on top of all that, I would always hated being center of attention. I'm, I'm a behind the scenes guy. Mm-hmm. And I hated public speaking, like really detested it. And I, you know, I'm here's Alan Gottlieb, a huge name that I, I researched and found out. And he's like, I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll speak at that. And I, then I turned to him, like, by the way, what is the GRPC? He's like, oh, the Gun Rights Policy Coalition. Uh, sorry, Gun Rights Policy Convention. Mm. And then he's like, I'm like, oh, also, by the way, how many people usually come to this thing? You know, I'm thinking, what, like, it's a gun rights conference, like 30, right? Yeah. He's like, oh, I don't know, between 350 and 500, depending on the year. And I went home and I walk into the house and my wife is like, your face is white. Mm-hmm. What happened? And I told her and my wife being incredibly supportive as she is through this her whole ordeal was like, well, suck it up. You said you're going to do it. And she walks away. <laughs> and, like, and, and I'm like, <laughs> wow, thank you for the moral support, you know? Yep. Um, so uh, so that's kind of how I fell into the two-way advocacy side. You know, I started off just writing a children's book. And then all of a sudden, I gave this speech at the Gun Rights Policy Conference. The next thing I know, I've, I was being called left and right for podcasts and radio. Oh, we have children's gun safety expert. I'm like, no, don't don't. I'm like, no, no. I'm I'm just a normal dude who wrote a book for his little kids, and I, I'm far from being an expert. But yeah. you know, over time, I, I've I've talked to instructor instructors, I've talked to safety advocates, and and would I call myself an expert now? Probably not, but a lot of people would. So yeah, well, you know what you're talking about. That's yeah. Pretty That's much. really what it comes down to, right? Um, <clears throat> so how many books you've written now, though? Like, is you you have four, five, six? Are we on, are we, is this podcast video or just audio? It's video. One, two, two. three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight. Okay. So, yeah, I I think I only knew about five or six of them. I have, uh, yeah. I haven't gotten them yet, but they <laughs> look really cool. Like, um, <clears throat> How how does it differ from like kids gun safety? How does it differ from normal gun safety? Is it just the wording? Is it like yeah? Know? It's really it, it's really wording. I mean, it's it, there's no just the the four cardinal rules are the four cardinal rules, right? You're, you're, those don't change. What to do if you find a gun somewhere? It's not to be doesn't change. Having a healthy respect for the firearms, making sure they're clean, making you know if you it, I, I know a lot of people that don't necessarily lock up their firearms. If you do lock up your firearms, you know. Ha- just having a respect for a firearm, right, as a tool. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just, I just do it. My my books. Well, 
not all of my books are kids books, but the kids books aspects of, of my books are written in a way that uh, kids six to 10 uh, can read. Um, as my wife says that you are a stupid baby. So you, it was very easy for you to uh, write kids books. Um, I make it sound like my wife is so like not supportive and stuff. My wife is amazing. She, she has been my right hand on this journey since I launched the Pew Pew Jew and the amount of support that she has given me is just, th there's not enough I can do for her in this lifetime that would equal up her support. So, but she's, 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 she's brutal. You know, she's like, she's like yeah. That's a good partner I'm, should be though. Oh, right? absolutely. Like, absolutely. <clears throat> so there are so no, many things that, uh, that I have, I would have screwed up royally had it not been for my wife going, are you sure about that? <laughs> oh, so, so my wife isn't even, are you sure about that? I'll like run an idea by her and she's like, you're an idiot. Don't do that. That's what you <laughs> And I'm like, thanks honey. You know, like, like, yeah. um, or she'll just make a face, right? She she gives me the same face of don't do that that she'll give to my kids when they're about to do something bad. Oh, um, that's a good one. Yeah, like like my one-year-old will like go to the bookshelf and she'll just be like, you know, mm -hmm. and I'll be like, hey, 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 I just I just have that idea. What do you think of it? And she goes, right? It's like the same, <laughs> same face, right? So, no, but I, I love I, I love her. She, she truly is my rock in the... Um, I couldn't do any of this without her, but yeah, like I said, I have, I have, let's see how many kids books I have. So I have that one is 105 explosive gun jokes. Technically it's for kids, but I'm finding more super corny dads are buying it for themselves. I was going to say it's probably full of dad jokes because really that's oh, the it best, is. best it's, jokes it's, ever. It's great. And, and it's so funny to see some of the reviews of saying like these book, these jokes are so stupid and literally in the, <laughs> It, like if you go to Amazon and look at the uh, the description of the book, it literally says the ultimate corny dad joke book. Like, like, like it, it, there's jokes in it. Like, and this one I'm so proud of because my my son's 13, but he came up with this joke himself that made it into the book when he was nine. It's like, why do revolver sh oh man, excuse me, why do revolver shooters hate parks? Why? Because they have slides. <laughs> Right, like, like, like horrible, like horrible, horrible. You know, like what's what's a what, what's oh. a gun's favorite food at a party? What guacamole? Right, like just right jokes that you're. I think the only joke that I came up with that I truly burst out laughing, like really, was actually that was a funny one. Was why didn't the college grad tell her parents how she paid for school? Why she was field stripping for money. <laughs> Oh, right like like that was like the only one that like when me and my partner wrote it we we both looked at each other and we're like oh that's actually funny you know we're like maybe we shouldn't put this one in the book because it really is a good joke um so, <laughs> but uh yeah, yeah it's it's the ultimate corny dad joke book uh all gun related 105 gun jokes yeah. Um, I would say about 98% of them are original jokes. The other like 2% are like random ones we found like on the sub, 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 sub Reddit, like, right. you know, but, um, but I mean, we, we would have loved to give props to the ones who wrote those, but obviously there was no, nothing yeah. to go on. So, but yeah, yeah, so I have a, I have a safety book. I have this book right here is a history of the second amendment for children. Yeah. Uh, this is the, this is the safety book version, but, uh, sorry, this is the safety book just in coloring book version. Okay. And then this one I wrote it's called 10 little liberals. I wrote that when I used to write for Ben Shapiro this one is the ABCs of guns, which is literally a break. You know, A is for ammunition and the AR-15. Yeah. So that's that's great if your kids are learning the ABCs and you want to do something fun. This one is ten little gun grabbers. Really poke, really pokes fun at you know the the people trying to um, take away our our Second Amendment rights. Yeah. And then my latest book, which came out about a year ago, is this one right here. Uh, called Bullet Points, Reasons Why America Should Embrace Common Sense Gun Law. Mm -hmm. And obviously we all know 
common sense gun law is code word for gun control, or- gun confiscation. <clears throat> so when that book came out, I mean, this is an amazing story. Yeah. This is a 220 page book of blank pages. There are no reasons why we should be embracing common sense gun law. I agree. So, I yes, so I literally came out with a book that has chapter titles, page numbers, headings, footers. I even have a bibliography in the back of the book. And you pick it up and it looks like a real book. Yep. And um I knew when that book would come out that I would get a lot of hate from the gun community because Let's be honest, even in our community, 95% of people are like, will judge a book by its cover and be too damn lazy to actually open do it up some and research. read it. Yeah. So I called, I don't know if you know uh, the Instagram account slash Twitter website, Mom at Arms. I don't so know. So you got to check them out. Mom at Arms is single handedly like taking on Mom's Demand Action and Shen Watts. And they are, they are brutal. I mean, they are just, they're like the firearms policy coalition of, you know, taking on mom's demand action. Mm-hmm. So the head of it, the woman who started it is a friend of mine named Jill. And I called her up. I'm like, Hey Jill, I'm coming out with this book in a month. I know how brutal you can be. So this is the idea of the book. Just so you don't think I'm a turncoat, right? Like yeah. I'm not throwing the second amendment under the bus. And she's like, oh, I'm going to have so much fun with this over the course of the month. She started pumping out articles like every other day that rumors are circulating that the Pew Pew Jew has sold out. He's, he's you know, pro common sense gun law. And she started building up this massive, massive campaign against me um, to the point where I had – instructors that you've heard of that people that we know met like high up there in the industry texting me and calling me like dude what is going on and i actually had to call them and explain to them what my book is and they were just like oh my god we want to be part of this so they (laughs) so all of a sudden all of a sudden this snowball effect started happening of all these people calling me out and 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 hey you know we don't really know what the book is, but you know, if it does, if you do come out with a book that's pro common sense gun law, we're gonna drag you through the mud. We are gonna besmirch your name, and like it was, it was fantastic. And then when the book finally came out, um, it was it was just unbelievable because you had some people on the left who bought the book, for example, and then wrote me horrible reviews <laughs> because they're like we bought this book and it was blank. <laughs> And even though on the description, on the description also says this book is mostly blank for those that can't take a joke, but people don't read. So I literally, so I had people on the left pit getting pissed off at me. I had people on the right without even looking into the book, calling me a red coat of Benedict Arnold, a turncoat, everything you can imagine, a traitor, wow. a traitor that they, they've been following me for years and, and they're unfriending me and they're unfollowing me because they can't believe I'm doing it. I'll be like, all right, you're going to feel like an idiot when, you know, you find out. And then, and then the best were some people were like, hey, listen, we know this was your eighth book. We've, been a, we've loved your content for a bunch of years. We, we bought the book because we trusted you and we just – we wanted to support you. And we figured if you were writing a book about this, maybe you, maybe you really did have – real points that would yeah. change her mind but it 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 reminds me of but then the reactions when they told me this were all like the same reaction you know from dumb and dumber you know just when they don't think you can do anything stupider you totally redeem yourself right and like all these people are like <laughs> oh my god we just went on amazon we bought like nine more copies so we can send them to our anti-gun sister-in-law and my grand my grandpa who's super pro gun like it was amazing. The, the rollout was fan- like just phenomenal. That's so, awesome. That that actually lends itself to kind of what we want to talk about today anyway, which is like the idea of storytelling. And yes. it's like creating the the idea, just the idea, and then sending it out all over the place. 
uh, is fantastic. I, I absolutely love that. I wish I had been on board with that because I would, <laughs> I would also have been on on board. I would have been on that in a heartbeat. That was that's fantastic. The um, thank you. So, have you always been a writer, or was it just more like you just kind of dove into it and it's exploded from there, or like no. where? How did that come about? So one thing I, I like I said, I, I'm a 100% the black sheep of my family, um, without without question. And one thing I will always credit my parents for, uh, credit for them doing right by me growing up. So when we, when my family, well, when I was five years old, uh, my parents actually took away the TV. Okay. Uh, they they said no more TV in the home. We had a TV. We weren't able to use it during the week. We were only able to watch movies on the weekend after homework was done. So uh, when I was five, I was kind of forced. This was like 89, right? We, we didn't have, you know, you were only the rich kids had those old school Game Boys, right? Like See, it comes back. the big gray ones. And um, uh, yeah, so. Are you frozen? Can you hear me? You're frozen, but you can't hear me. There he hey. is. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. It just you randomly like disappeared, and it, no, it, it was it, it was funny because like I'm in the middle of talking, and then it was like one of those things like right out of a movie. They're like, I'm like, hello, I'm like anyone, anyone, you know, like like and like and I'm like, nope, you're frozen. Um, but okay, so uh, yeah. what what, um, what I got was you're the black sheep of your family. Okay, and then. I think you were about to say you're like my parents and then I'm like, got it. Okay. So I'll start from, I'm the black sheep of the family. So if you have to edit it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I'm, I'm clearly the black sheep in my family always have been. And, but one thing I will definitely credit my parents with is taking away the TV when I was five. Um, it was straight up no more TV during the week. No, no more TV during the weekend. We were able to rent movies, but only after, Homework was done. Yeah, and keep in mind that this was this was eighty nine, right? So like, okay, no no one had games, and you know, only those super rich kid had like the the, <clears> old the original school Nintendo. Game. But yeah, the original Game Boy that was like this big yeah. and weighed like ninety five pounds. So um, my parents took away the TV, and that kind of forced me to pick up books, and you know, books just. You know, being the black sheep, um, books were just an escape. It, it was it, it was a it was a tran- transporter to another world, to, to different worlds, to to everywhere that I always wished I can go. Um, and one one author in particular, actually, because um, oh, so okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. I, I'm I'm horrible like that. That's how I got into writing. Uh, I've okay. always been incredibly creative because I was reading. So growing up, I used to write like really, really horrible poems, um, super, super corny. But, you know, they, they were got me into writing. So yeah. um, definitely growing up without a TV 
shaped my writing abilities. But again, I never ever thought I would be a published and successful author. That that literally was never a thing. I always enjoyed creative writing, but I never thought again that you know I'd be successful at it. Yeah. So that's a that's an interesting thing because when I was young, my parents used to read me really advanced books. When we were like me and my brother, and my sister, I'm the youngest of three, and uh, we got like when we got bedtime stories, it was like Lord of the Rings and Dune. And uh, <laughs> Jurassic Park, Shogun, like big, right. deep novels that we would have to like continually spend weeks reading rather than just these little snippets of stuff. And uh, that it actually and now helped us. Now, and, now you're, and now you're screwed up for that because Shogun is not a kid, kid-friendly kid book. No, it's not. <laughs> but <laughs> um, what it did was it, it gave us a really advanced reading level because we were yeah. comprehending like the, or sorry, my, uh, my reading comprehension was extremely high when I was in grade school and I was reading at a post-secondary level. So I I know exactly what you mean, right? Like you, you get that extra step in that direction by maybe sometimes the removal of something. My mom used to take the TV cord and she would cut it in half and then take the plug with her. And so that we (laughs) couldn't watch TV. And it was like super smart until my brother and I figured out that the cord for the TV was the same as basically most electronics. And we found a toaster in a, in the garbage somewhere, found a cord, <laughs> cut that off. And then we had one on our own. So, <laughs> we got so you got, no, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I was that kid that, you know, when I was in fifth, sixth, seventh grade, um, I'd be sitting during recess, reading a book. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'd definitely be playing sports too. I, mean, I played sports in high school, but man, there, there's nothing just like opening a good book. And and screw Kindles and digital readers. I hate those yep. things. You need to have the smell of those pages. You need to have mm-hmm. the ink on your finger. Ah, oh, there's nothing like I, it. One of the my favorite sounds is like complete silence. Right, you're just in complete silence, and you have the page turn. That yes, yep, and like it's just such a great sound. Uh, I I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, it's it's awesome. Um, and it yeah. does. It really opens. It's it transports you to worlds that you would never be able to to engage in in any other way. Right. I used to read this uh, really great book series called um, <clears throat> the Zant series by an author named Piers Anthony. I don't know if you ever read any of his stuff. Cool fantasy stuff, right? There's people riding horses and unicorns and dragons and blah blah blah. blah. It was just awesome. But what it does is it separates you from the reality of the world. Right, it allows right. you to step out of that. Um, right. Do you find that w- was that a, a similar feeling for you when you when you were reading as a kid, or even as you got older? Was it a, like as, as an escape, or was it more just like the fantasy of it? So, so it was more of an escape. Uh, like I said, I was always the black sheep, and mm-hmm. I'm also a middle child, so I mm. definitely suffer from middle child syndrome. Um, <laughs> there's no question about that. But, um, you know, man, I love this topic because there's that very famous line, you are what you eat, right? But I, I've kind of crossed that over to you are what you read. Yeah. And my favorite author growing up, I started reading him in sixth grade when he had like 12 or 13 books. Now he's got like 80 books. Um, Clive Cussler. Okay. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. But nope. uh, he has a, one of his books were made into a movie that they butchered with Matthew McConaughey called Sahara. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. And, and the character, at least in the original, he has like five different series, but the original character is a guy named Dirk Pitt. And Dirk Pitt was the type of guy who wa- was the perfect chivalrous knight, if you will. But again, it takes place in modern times. Yeah, he, he was it. He was Indiana Jones meets James Bond meets freaking John Wick, right? Like yeah. this guy was just—he was able to wine and dine his beautiful girlfriend at night, but then during the day he was diving on shipwrecks and saving the world from egomaniac 
yeah. people and his but his books were all about um all dealt with water mm. so growing up i always wanted to be i mean this is kind of like a little not a lot of people know about me but my my dream job growing up was to be a marine archaeologist um i i've loved i love being on the water i love being under the water i've done scuba diving and this character was just pure let's call it toxic masculinity right like <laughs> just pure masculine and yep. uh you know there was there was no gray zone with him right the the character Dirk Pitt there was either good and evil and what i liked about the books also is every bad guy in all of his like 80 books that he has unfortunately Clive Custer just passed away about 2 years ago um okay. he was in his 90s but um all of the bad guys in his books there was no uh troubled bad guy right it wasn't like oh mm. i'm being pulled for the good it's like no you had the good guys who were good and you had the bad guys who were evil end of yeah. story and it wasn't like oh i'm being torn do i do the right thing do i not no i'm gonna go with the be a bad like it wasn't like that and and that's what i loved about his books and he was probably the biggest influence on my writing career mm -hmm. um not only because i i i read and i still continue to read because you know some people have taken over his writing um since he's passed but uh i still read him but when i was 18 or 19 19 19 when I was 19, I actually wrote a 120-page movie script. No. Oh. And I sent it to Clive Cussler, thinking, you know, why not? Well, doesn't hurt. Yeah. And I remember about six weeks after I sent it to him, I get a letter in the mail from, you know, Return Edges with Clive Cussler. And I was absolutely terrified to open this because here is, like, not just an author that I love, but here is someone who's written so many books who, again, I, I started reading him when I was in sixth grade. So we're talking about I was 12. Now I'm 18, right? So over the course yeah. of like six years, truly has shaped my life, um, really shaped my life. And, and my personality, I wanted to be this character that he wrote about. So I was terrified that his letter back to me would be just one of those moments where your hero writes back to you and you're like, and it's just like, like, thanks for the support. That's it. Yeah. This page right here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight paragraphs. He wrote wow. back to me, eight paragraphs. And it's completely custom because he actually dissected my screenplay so not and only did he write back but he read it and wanted it. to give you points yeah that's awesome and he he critiqued it but nowhere no i mean like literally the last line is um uh where was it uh when raise the titanic became a bestseller and i could finally write full-time p bill used to tell me congratulations on your overnight success he goes my answer yeah, 11 years. Yeah. And like his letter to me was just like, you know what? I don't care how many books he comes out with. I will never, ever stop reading him. And like I said, he's influenced, he influenced my, my personality, my writing. He has just been, I mean, he was, like I said, just a complete ad advisor, if you will. Yeah. on my life <laughs> and i know yeah i know we talked about it right and like that's just reading for me is so therapeutic yeah so how do you how do you do you find that like you read more when you get into a stressful situation or does it like or is it more of a reactionary thing of like you know my my life's going all over the place right now i need a few minutes to go sit down and read or is it more everyday kind of maintenance kind of deal um, it's kind of i mean i also have four kids range rate uh, you know from ages one to 13 so yeah 
I don't have the same amount of time that I wish I had. I think yeah. that I have my sa- I have my Sabbath because you know mm-hmm. with my Sabbath there's no electronics. I can let just shut down. So when my kids go to bed or if they're playing upstairs, I can actually sit down, ignore my wife, and keep on reading. Yeah. Um, but you know, one thing that I do find myself doing besides reading is putting on some noise canceling headphones, just kind of getting into bed, you know, showering maybe early, uh, earlier in the evening, like getting into bed. And then I love uh, movie scores. Like I absolutely yeah. love movie scores. So I'll just put them on and just close my eyes and lie down in bed. And I can I mean, that is just, it calms my entire body down. I just, it, it's, oh, it's amazing. Yeah. It, it's actually quite interesting. I, I found the, um, <clears throat> the way not only um, music or, um, but reading just basically the use of your uh, subconscious, I guess, really. Cause what, like you can actively read something, but there's a different feeling to when you're just reading and time just kind of passes and similar with music too i used to use um uh, gregorian chanting actually was really cool i always and that's what i'd like to fall asleep to so i usually had music going um as i was falling asleep and i went to basic training <laughs> and uh i at one point i had i would hook up my phone and I'd have the music playing it would be like super low and the guys next to me could hear it but they were they were like oh whatever that's fine by me and then i think a couple other people had heard it when they were walking past my bed and they were like, Oh, that's pretty good. Can you turn that up? So at one point I had it like up on the walls of my, uh, my little cubicle and basic training. And I like turned the volume right up and we'd be listening to Gregorian chanting as everyone was falling asleep and stuff. And, uh, that's, and then I, yes. I got woken up by a drill sergeant real fast. After I think after that one, and he was just like, what the fuck is that? Get it off. The- no, 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 no. And I was doing push ups in the middle of the night. It was, uh, it was good times, but you know, the, the ability to, you know, kind of shut down the, um, the forebrain, right. To be able to just shut that down and experience music or experience the book or, um, I don't know. It's like an emotional, you get to tap into something emotional. You know what I'm saying? No, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Like I said, between, between my books and I'm very picky with what I read. Uh, I'm not mm-hmm. one of these people. Everyone's like, oh, you should read James Patterson. This, I'm like, don't care. Don't care about those people. Um, so, you know, uh, right now there's like, I think like three fictional authors I read. Mm-hmm. Four, four. Four fictional okay. authors I read. And that's about it. Most of the other stuff is historic or, um, like I said, I'm very into politics. So I'll read stuff like that. Um mm-hmm. You know, but uh, yeah. Uh, cool thing is, though, one of my favorite author, really, he became my favorite author of all time. Um, I've actually become friends with him. Uh, we've never met officially, but we we talk all the time via email. Uh, Stephen Pressfield. Oh wow! I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Are you familiar with Stephen Pressfield? Kind of. <laughs> I, so, I recognize so he, the name basically, but I. So he has he has a very famous book called the War of the War, the uh, War of Art. Okay. Instead of the Art of War, the War of Art. He yeah, basically, yeah. it's yeah. you know, anyone anyone who is like one of these like TED Talk billionaire gurus will all say that like that's in their top ten that everyone has to read. Yeah. Um, he has a great book called Gates of Hell. Uh, Gates of Fire, I'm sorry, um, that is a a dramatization of the Battle of Thermopylae. Mm-hmm. And he writes a lot about the warrior mentality and overcoming obstacles. And so he, he he's my favorite author of all time at this point. Yeah. I own every single one of his books. I actually helped him out with some stuff. And all these books right here are all signed copies of books from him. Sweet. Um, oh, yeah, it was awesome. I, I helped him with something super small and then like two weeks later i get like this like 80 pound box and it's like oh i know you said you liked uh i know you know this is your favorite book and blah 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 so here is a bunch of signed copies and what he did is so cool 
I was literally like a 14 year old girl at a Justin Bieber concert. I was so giddy. My wife was making so much fun of me. Um, he actually, not only did he inscribe each book, but he actually wrote a different inscription for each book. So, and it was catered. It was catered to me. It wasn't like, oh, thanks for everything. Or, you know, or it was like literally uh, things that he knew about me that he, so it was awesome. So he is someone that I absolutely love. And his books, if you're, Listeners out there are not familiar with Stephen Pressfield. Um, I cannot even begin to tell you how life changing his books are. I'm gonna I'm gonna dive in there right now. Actually, as soon as we're done here, I and I, I remember being told about uh, the War of Art, War of Art, or on Art. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, the War of Art. Yeah. Of Art. Yeah. Okay. I remember being told about that, and I, I just haven't put it in my collection yet. But uh, it's going in there today. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'll tell you, definitely read that one. I mean, if I know you're a veteran, so anyone who's a veteran, um, the Gates of Fire is unbelievable. The, the Battle of Thermopylae in the 300, um, and then he has another book. Uh, I mean, all of his books are amazing, but he has one book, which after reading it, immediately went into my top five of all time, called um, oh, of course, right when you need to know, I, I see the cover. Um, <laughs> God. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah That's like, it happens every time. Your favorite book, right? It happens yeah. every time. Um, <laughs> okay, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Good. This is, this is, uh, uh, this, this well, is while you think crazy. about that, the, the thing I was going to say about this whole thing is that, you know, books are, are the, the original remote learning tool, right? It's, it's yes. a way to pass information. And even if it is fictional or nonfiction, whatever, like it allows somebody somewhere else to learn something anywhere right right? like this is the i say all the time that you know this particular medium the fact we can do podcasts we do video chats and all these things it's great and we can utilize this and it's something that we've never had as a community before to be able to interact like this but books were the original man that's how you passed on the information no absolutely um, just wait. The book is called "The Virtues of War," Ooh. and it's the entire story and campaign of Alexander the Great, told from the eyes of Alexander the Great. And what makes it fe- phenomenal is by the end of the book. Like, I don't know if I don't know if you're familiar with the whole story of Alexander the Great and all of his generals. And yep, by the end of the book. I would have laid my life down for Alexander the Great, but at the same time, and and I'd never had this feeling before, literally, I would have been willing to lay my life down for him, but at the same time, hated him with such a passion. It's the writing, the virtues of war, it's just mind-blowing, absolutely mind-blowing. So um, I highly recommend Gates of Fire, Virtues of War, and the war of art i will i will pick them up that uh sounds like awesome reads now are they're like historical fiction right they kind of like follow the same thing but not yeah not so, so he i would say half of his book so he's got a bunch of non-fiction self-help books like the war of art he has mm-hmm. another one that's been actually making its rounds called uh put your ass wherever your heart is or wherever your heart wants to be which yeah. is a great one also so he's got a couple books like that, um, but then he has m- majority of his fictional work is historical fiction, um, and most of it takes place in Athens, Sparta, um, some sort of you know Greek. Yeah, uh, I was going to say uh, like grand history, something. Right. Ex- yeah, and, and you know follows the campaigns and and. Uh, I mean, it, it's eye-opening because it really gives you, again, he touches on real history, right? It's not like, yeah. right? Obviously, he doesn't know what the generals were saying, you know, behind Alexander's back. So, obviously, he fills that in. But the, the stuff is just fantastic. Yeah. So, I, I highly recommend anything Stephen Pressfield writes. I, I will jump on that because that uh, I know a lot of guys up here would uh... – would appreciate that as well. I know a few history buffs that always love uh, a good historical fiction. Because, I mean, really, also, anything about history and writing as a whole is that that's the only reason we know about history 
is because right. yeah, somebody, somebody's written it down somewhere, right? And that's the yeah. passage of information through time that allows us to, you know, read about something and then, you know, make our interpretation of it. Because, you know, one thing I learned, uh, I was reading uh, Dave Grossman's On Combat while I was in Afghanistan. And cool. uh, I think I have there, that right here somewhere on my yeah. desk. It's, it's a great book. I got a couple of copies. I think I usually hand out to people too. Um, but I was reading it and the information that I was gaining while I was there were reflections of what was happening. Right. So like I got into a firefight, there was this, apparently an RPG went over my head. I don't recall that ever happening. Uh, but I went back to uh, the fob and while I was like reading, I think two or three days after that was like visual explosion will happen. You know, sometimes this person will, uh, in a critical incident, one person will see something and the other person won't. Right. Even though they're like right beside each other, it just happens that way sometimes. So just being able to have that information and then apply it to me directly in that situation, <sighs> sweet, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that helped me so much. So I always love the fact that, you know, history as a whole is told to us because of someone's writing. Someone had sat there and decided to tell the story and then someone else decided to write that down. Right. However it happened and went, and went from there. Do you, uh, do you have any other, um, any particular styles of writing when you decide to sit down and write, or do you try to, you know, make it up as you go along? Is it more like your own style or are you practiced enough yeah. to kind of take no, something think, from somebody I, else? I think it's more my own style. Um, yeah. I fancy myself as a mediocre writer, but I do have an amazing, I mean, amazing editor who just makes me sound a hell of a lot smarter than I actually am. Um, so she, she, she is, uh, like I said, I, I have a very special place for this woman. Uh, she's in the yeah. firearms industry too. She's an editor for a massive website, which I'm sure you know of. But mm -hmm. uh, she she has had my back since my first book came out. So um, she's awesome. I love her. And she makes me sound much smarter than I actually am. Okay. That's awesome. Now, would uh, for all the people out there that are looking to write a book, per se, or perhaps, um, what uh, what's one piece of advice you would give yourself when you first started? Sit your ass down and just do it. You you are your own worst enemy. And mm -hmm. I know we've heard that numerous times, but when it comes to writing, write one sentence at a time. That's it. Yeah. Uh, I know. I know. You said one piece of advice, but the idea is just the, the idea is just do it. Right. Like. Yeah. The only person holding you back from writing is yourself. Yeah. You you are literally the only person. Right? I was told. By so many people don't write a book on gun safety for children because it's pointless. No one's going to get it. Yeah. I have eight books in five years. I have an incredibly successful and recognizable brand in the firearms industry that I've built from the ground up all by myself. Um, I'm still running my entire brand by myself. I don't yeah. have anyone helping me. Um, I, I'm doing it all. And it's all because, I sat down and I started writing that first sentence. Yeah. So, you know, some people will tell you, well, you know, write an outline of what you want in each chapter, which, hey, yes, absolutely do that if that's the type of books you're going to write. I write children's books and blank books. So yeah. literally, uh, you know, <laughs> literally children's books and blank books. So I'm, I'm not – I don't necessarily need to be sitting there and, and writing – 200, 3, 4, 500 words per chapter, if not more. So yeah. um, just sit down and write that first sentence. Because if, if you don't, you're not going to. Yeah, that is the, probably the best advice I've heard for basically anything. Um, I tell this to vets. I tell this to um, you know people that are struggling. Anything that you get to a point where you're like, eh, I don't know if I really don't know, just like start, just begin. Just like, do it, yeah. All that's all it takes. Once you begin, then you can make decisions. Then you can say, well, you know, this is, this is horrible. This is bad. I can't, well, I can't keep this up, but it's like I said, right. 
what Stephen Pressfield's book right there, that middle one on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Put your ass where your heart wants to be. It's literally, it's that simple. If you want to become a writer and you want to do it. Now, again, I understand you might get writer's block, whatever. But if you truly want it, sit down in that chair, write that first sentence and keep on writing. My book was literally turned down. My first book was turned down by over 35 literary agents, 35 publishing companies. I actually eventually found a publishing company after I found an agent. It was going to be a huge publishing company. I was going to get the book out into every bookstore. Three months after I signed the contract, they canceled the deal. And it sucked. I went into a serious dark place in my life. Mm -hmm. Probably the darkest I've ever been um, because it's something I really wanted. But... I pushed through and I did it because I wanted it that badly. So sit down. You're going to get bumps along the road, but just write one sentence at a time. That's it. Um, I, I got this line from a movie from many years ago. With kids, you might've seen it. It's called spirit stallion of the Cimarron. Um, Great score. Great, great score. score. Beautifully done. Um, Yeah. Brian Adams, like kicked the crap out of that one. He he did really well on that. Um, The, one of the lines from that has always stuck with me and I love it. It's the, the Colonel who's talking and he's like time, patience, and discipline are the three great levelers. Yep. And a hundred percent they are right. If you take enough time with enough patience and you're disciplined that you will achieve whatever it is you want to achieve. Yeah. Look, yeah. My, my next book, I know we talked about it a little earlier, right? But my, mm-hmm. my next book, um, man, it's the biggest project I've ever undertaken and i'm talking about literally the biggest project in my life i've ever Mm -hmm. done um and you know i understand that it might take a year maybe even two years to get this project completely finished which sucks because i only thought about it two weeks ago so i've got that (laughs) long haul right i'm not even like i'm I'm like so far from even being remote like i may be at like 0.5 percent out of 100 percent done and but it's one of those things right I'm, i'm gonna sit there I'm going to push through. I'm going to be disciplined because this is something that I really want. Um, And, uh, you know, um, it could be my most successful book ever. Yeah. I hope it is because it like, from what we talked about, it's going to be amazing. At least in my point of view. Yeah. Look, I said, it's not nothing that's ever been done before. So it's going to be a very interesting take and it's going to be a very interesting to to see how people react to it. Um, And no, it's not blank and that's not a joke book. This is actually going to have real words in it and real writing. Yeah. So real that, English words. <laughs> yeah. Real, real English words, not for children. Yeah. Uh, that, that yeah. That's going to be I'm awesome. Actually, I'm actually adulting. So, awesome. uh, yeah. That's going to be great. Um, now we've been running for a little bit over an hour here. I, I really, I appreciate just wanted to let you know how much I appreciate you being on here. It has been my absolute pleasure um, just learning from you. And there's some great tools for a lot of people here. Are there anything, any last minute uh, points or things that are burning inside of you about storytelling uh, that you want to get off to the world? No, it's funny. No one's ever asked me that. But one thing I find <laughs> is when, when you're, when you're writing and, and, and it's one of the reasons why I, hate nearly every movie that comes out mm-hmm. when you're writing and you're like oh that'll be really really funny if we put that in the movie or that'll be really really cool <laughs> take a second look at the world around you is it going to be really funny or is it going to be like cliche been there done that that was very three months ago right like, you're writing something now but it's not going to come out for a while, is it still going to be something that people will find funny? Yeah. And I find I find people in, from all walks of life posting these super cliche, super uh, you know, been there, done that, um, and you're sitting there, and you're like, why would they even put that in there? Like, I just don't get it. Like, yeah. And I, I'm trying to think, there, there was a movie I just saw. 
that I was actually enjoying. And then they threw in this one thing at the, like towards the end. I'm just like, no, why you just, no, you suck. Why? <laughs> um, and I'm trying, I'm trying to think what it was. Oh, it was from the new predator movie. I don't remember the exact scene. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you watched it. Uh, actually pretty decent movie. Um, I haven't seen it yet, they, they, but I'm looking forward to it. Definitely worth watching. But there was one thing in the movie, like the whole movie was so gritty. And then there was one thing where you're like, really? You had to like, come on. No, why would you put that in there? It just doesn't fit with the whole ambiance over the flow of the movie. So, you know, when you're thinking about putting something into whatever you're writing, take that one step back and be like, okay, does it fit with the overall theme? And is it corny? Like, is it just like, you know, the, re- like, you know what I'm talking about? Like when you watch something and you're like, oh, come on, really? <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. Stupid. Like, oh, like you guys uh, are yeah. getting paid millions of dollars. Why would you put it in like that? Like yeah. so many other ways you could have taken, but like, why would you go like super like cliche and, and like, just ruin the flow. So yeah, yeah. just, you know, um, anyone well, who's ha- thinking about writing, just do that, you know? This this happens to me all the time anytime I see a movie that has explosives in it, because <clears throat> I was a combat engineer and that's what I dealt with a lot. And uh, it is, it's painful. It's painful when you sit there and like somebody throws a grenade and there's a giant fireball and you're like, mm-hmm, well, there goes the rest of the movie for me. <laughs> <laughs> right. So again, okay, so I hear that, and, but that that's more of like a, a ignorance thing, right? That's more of right. That's more of more well, of like Hollywood being ignorant to the actual to the reality of a situation. I don't think it's so much ignorance as so much as it needs to be like Hollywood Hollywood ask, right. right? Like there are there's subject matter experts that are sitting there on the site that are telling people like this is not how explosives work, but. Right. Um, I, I so, mean, I, I hear but I get you. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, but I just – and don't get me wrong. When, when you know, um, anytime I watch a movie or a TV show and, you know, they're holding the gun, teacup, I'm just like, no, nah, you're an idiot. You know, like I'm yelling at the TV and my wife's yeah. like, stop it. And But, you know, I, I think just when, when you're watching something that's so good and then they just do something that's – I'll give you. I'll give you a, a, a very easy um, example that everyone's going to know. Think sure. Golden Eye, right? Yeah. G- great James Bond movie, right? Yeah. The movie itself was fantastic, but let's be honest. When he had that scene at the beginning where the airplane jumps off, he jumps off, you know, the cliff. I'm oh, sorry, the airplane falls off, and he's like skydiving right down, and he gets into the airplane, like. At the time, that might have been cool in like the mid nineties, yep. and you might be even you might even be able to say like, okay, that's cool, but like you're like, yeah, not really believable. Think think today, right? Yeah. If you if my son who's thirteen goes back and watches that today, he'll be like, that's just pure crap. Yeah. Pure crap. Yeah. So like that's what I'm saying, right? Like, now I get it. You're you're doing it for the times necessarily, right? You're not doing it for you know, for the generations to come. But think about all those movies that you've seen that have lasted the test of time. And none of them have any of these, like, cliche, corny things where you're like, uh, really? You know, I mean, how how many times have you seen uh, Blazing Saddles, right? Like, probably too many times to count. Yeah. But the reason why you can keep going back to it is because there are no cliche, stupid things that are like, oh no, that's just dumb. Like, yeah, it's timeless. Yeah, and they're well. The, the funny thing is, is that those the points that are like cliche, they're done on purpose to make them funny. But but that right exactly yeah. But a hundred percent. I'm just saying, you know, if any yeah, yeah. if no. anyone wants to like write out there, you know, like um, my, my son just had a bar mitzvah this past week, and you know, I made the slideshow. Yeah. And as I'm going through the pictures of the slideshow and like, oh, that will actually be funny. And I put this cool transition in there and, and it looks awesome. And I'm like, I go back like like 30 minutes later and I'm like, okay, got to you know, rewatch the slideshow 45 times until, you know, the music syncs up. And I'll watch that one scene. I'm like, 
oh, I broke my cardinal rule. Yeah. I'm like, nope, you're out because that just made me cringe. Bye bye. Basically, that's what it is. Don't put anything in your writing that you yourself would cringe at in real life. If you read it or saw it and you're like, oh, don't put that in. Think long that, and hard of whether or not it's worth putting that in. That is a that's a great point. If you make yourself cringe, don't add it to your writing. <laughs> don't add it. Don't add okay. it. So if uh, if anybody that isn't following you would like to, where can they find you? How would they find your books? What would they where would they go to get this stuff? Yeah, absolutely. So across social media, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, especially Instagram, that's where I do a lot of stuff. Um, it's at the Pew Pew Jew. Please don't forget the um, the Pew Pew Jew. You can go to my website, the Pew Pew Jew dot com. Mm-hmm. If you feel that my signature on a book is worth all of worth all of eight dollars, feel free to purchase signed copies on my website. If not, and you want to be cheap, go to Amazon because they're up there too. Um, and if you need to reach reach out to me, like I said, um, I do a lot of Instagram. Is probably Instagram and Twitter are probably the two best ways to reach out to me, uh, or through my website. Raj. Awesome. Well, Yehuda, I, I can't thank you enough, man. It has been an, my absolute pleasure just sitting here chatting with you about books and <laughs> reading and stuff. It has been, thank it has you. been awesome. Thank you very much. Um, Absolutely. And uh, yeah, I can't I can't wait to read those books. I, I'm, I got uh, it's Simon Pressfield, right? Uh, uh, Stephen. Stephen so Pressfield. Tired. I am Stephen horrible Pressfield, with names, yeah. so like, I, I'm really working it just for memory. <laughs> I'm gonna forget yeah, no, like in about I said, ten seconds. Just, 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 just message me. I'll, I'll send you to his website. Raj, perfect. All right, thank you very much. We'll, uh, we'll talk to you soon. Sounds good, man. That concludes another episode of the Toolbox. I really appreciate y'all listening. It has been my absolute pleasure bringing you this guest. If you enjoyed what you heard, please like, share, subscribe, do all that other wicked stuff. It uh, helps me keep the lights on. To all those out there putting it on the line every day, I just want to let you know that I appreciate you. Military, veterans, first responders, civil servants, you name it, keep this place running, and I really do appreciate it. So thank you. Don't forget, stay open, stay humble, stay focused, with grace, not slack. Shimo. Shimo.